Good morning. Good morning. Welcome to Redeemer Lutheran Church. It is so good to see you this morning. Um, after God has blessed us with some just terrific rain, Friday night and yesterday afternoon, um, God is good. Boy, it was so good to drive into town and to see puddles in July. Uh, there's not much better than that here in Nebraska, is there? Uh, so with the good rainstorm, though, comes some, some bad things. I think we had a close lightning strike here by church. Um, wiped out our telephone lines and our internet. And you may see the screens look a little funky this morning. So this, this image is supposed to be blue. And so two of the screens are completely not working. Two of the screens are doing their best for us this morning. And I'm missing my cheater screen, so I can't really see what's going on in the screens this morning. So Kathy's going to be kind of running the show this morning. So uh, we're dependent upon Kathy, but no, we're very, very thankful for the rain. Uh, as the corn continues to grow, it, it sure is beautiful out there. Uh, last Sunday was a great Sunday here in Hubbard. Uh, our, our great 4th of July parade uh, celebration. I know the cornhole tournament that our youth put on was a great success. We tried an old-fashioned hymn sing in the park at 3.30. That was a blast. Um, Redeemer, a lot of the other area churches helped put that together. I think we're going to try that again next year. And then our, our pie and ice cream social. Someone told me they thought we gave out more pies than we've ever done in the past. And so it was just a great, great 4th uh, of July here in town. Uh, so just a, a very, very good day that God has blessed us with. You'll notice in your bulletin, if you flip it to the back side, we are going to be doing a new picture directory. Uh, I think it's about 15 years since we put together a directory, so it's past time that we do so. Uh, we don't have it out yet today, but starting next Sunday... We will have a physical sheet with different time slots for you to sign up to take your pictures, uh, your family pictures, you name it. Um, but today, this week, if you're able to go online, uh, the website is right there printed out. The website is ucvir.com. And then our church has a specific code that is just for Redeemer, any 125 and then the password there is photos, that you can sign up for your own spot today before other people claim their spots. But starting, Sherry saying no, is that? Can't sign up on the weekend. Monday they can start signing up. Thank you, Sherry. Yeah, starting tomorrow you can sign up. But traditionally the Saturday and Sunday are closed so that when you do sign up on the hard paper that those spots are not uh, already claimed. So starting next Sunday... You just want to come to church and find a good slot that works for you. Um, that's going to be a uh, Tuesday and Wednesday, two weeks in a row, um, August 17th, 18th, as well as 24th and 25th. <coughs> VBS is next week. It is next Tuesday to Thursday. Uh, we've had a lot of our kids sign up for VBS already. It's not too late to sign up, so... Um, you do not have to be a member of Redeemer Lutheran. Uh, so if you have grandkids, if you know of neighbor kids, um, any kids really here in the community, it's a free event. Uh, so please help get the word out and about. Uh, we've got a terrific BBS. It's called Diving Into God's Word. Uh, so we'll have three nights of fun BBS here at Redeemer. <laughs> Lastly, I need to ask for your forgiveness. Um, I know we've really been trying to keep adult Bible study going throughout the summertime, and we've had a hard time doing so as people go on vacations, and we have the 4th of July and other things. Uh, today, we need to cancel because of me. Uh, my boys had their, their last baseball games of the season. Benny, in particular, had his last baseball game of the season, so I want to make sure to get there uh, to watch it. So no adult Bible study this morning. We will try to start it again next Sunday. I'm beginning to realize why Pastor Joel never had Bible study in the summer, though. It's just really hard with people vacationing and different things going on. Uh, but we will try beginning next Sunday, beginning our adult Bible study once again. Our worship continues with our call to worship found on page one of your bulletin. God has accomplished 
all things through Christ, so that we might live as God's own children. Let us give thanks to God and live for the praise of God's glory. Jesus loves us with steadfast tenderness. Therefore, let us confess our sins to God. Holy God, you call us to be your beloved children and to care for one another. Yet we fail to love others and ourselves. Helpless and ashamed, we turn our hearts to you. Forgive us and then tenderly teach us to stand strong and courageous in the fullness of your love. By the grace and mercy of Christ, Sisters and brothers, God forgives us and strengthens us for love. Therefore, be at peace. Amen. <coughs> and let us pray. Eternal God, from the foundation of the world, you have set a plumb line to measure our lives so that we may live in truth. By the power of your Holy Spirit, strengthen our hands for building justice and making peace through the righteousness of Christ. Amen. Would you please rise if you're able as we sing our opening hymn, The Church's One Foundation.
A reading from Amos, the seventh chapter. This is what the Lord God showed me. The Lord was standing beside a wall built with a plumb line, with a plumb line in his hand. And the Lord said to me, Amos, what do you see? And I said, a plumb line. Then the Lord said, see, I am setting a plumb line in the midst of my people Israel. I will never again, again pass them by. The high places of Isaac shall be made desolate, and the sanctuaries of Israel shall be laid waste. And I will rise against the house of Jeroboam with the sword. Then Amazah, the priest of Bethel, sent to King Jeroboam of Israel, saying, Amos has conspired against you in the very center of the house of Israel. The land is not able to bear all his words, for thus Amos has said, Jeroboam shall die by the sword, and Israel must go into exile and away from this land. And Amaz said to Amos, O seer, go, flee away to the land of Judah, earn your bread there, and prophesy there, but never again prophesy at Bethel, for it is the king's sanctuary, and it is a temple of the kingdom. Then Amos answered Amaz, I am not a pro I am no prophet, nor a prophet's son, but I am a herdsman, and a dresser of sycamore trees. And Lord and the Lord took me from following the flock, and the Lord said to me, Go prophesy to the people of Israel. The word of God, the word of life. Thanks be to God. We'll read responsibly Psalm eighty five. I will listen to what the Lord God is saying, for you speak peace to your faithful people and to those who turn their hearts to you. Truly your salvation is very near to those who fear you, that your glory may dwell in our land. Steadfast love and faithfulness have met together. Righteousness and peace have kissed each other. Faithfulness shall spring up from the earth, and righteousness shall look down the Lord will indeed grant prosperity, and our land will yield its increases. Righteousness shall go before the Lord, and shall prepare for God a pathway. Our second lesson is taken from Ephesians, the first chapter. Blessed be the God, the Father, our Lord Jesus Christ, who has blessed us in Christ with every spiritual blessing in the heavenly places. Just as he chose us in Christ before the foundation of the world to be holy and blameless before him in love, he destined us for adoption as his children through Christ, through Jesus Christ, according to the good pleasure of his will, to the praise of his glorious grace that he freely bestows on us in the beloved. In him we have redemption through his blood, the forgiveness of our trespasses according to the riches of his grace, that he lavished on us. With all wisdom and insight, he has made known to us the mystery of his will, according to his good pleasure that he set forth in Christ, as a plan for the fullness of time to gather up the things in him, things in heaven and things on earth. In Christ, we have also obtained an inheritance, having been destined according to the purpose for him who accomplishes all things according to his counsel and will so that we, who are the first to set our hopes on Christ, might live for the praise of his glory. In him also, when you had heard the word of truth, the gospel of your salvation, and had believed in him, were marked with the seal of the promised Holy Spirit. This is the pledge of our inheritance towards redemption as God's own people. To the praise of his glory, word of God, word of life. Time I'll ask any boys or girls that might be in church this morning to please come on up for our children's message. Thank you. 
basketball at church with me this morning because I want to talk to you in a little bit about sports. Raise your hand if you've ever played a sport. I know you played I see a lot of kids with their hands up. They got a lot of sports players. Raise your hand if you like to play sports. I see a lot of hands still up. A lot of kids like to play sports. Do you think Pastor Casey likes to play sports? I love sports. In fact, when I was your age, sports were probably my favorite thing to do. I like to play baseball. Do you guys like to play baseball? Softball? I like to play football. Do any of you guys like to play football? You play, you play baseball? Yep. How about basketball? Does anybody play basketball? Has anybody played basketball before? I like to play basketball too. And when I was a kid, so I was a little bit older than you guys are now. I was about 13. And I was in middle school. And a lot of times, a group of friends and me would sometimes play basketball together. But we would play, um, we'd have teams by having two different kids choose who they wanted to be on their team. We call them two captains. And so one of the captains would look at all the other boys, which I was a part of, and they would try and decide which one of these boys is the best basketball player because I want him on my team. I remember standing there, and I was like, ooh, 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 pick me, ooh, 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 pick me, pick me. <laughs> Who would they pick me? No, I was never the first one picked. A different kid first, so then the other team would pick their first player. Once again, ooh, ooh, pick me, pick me, pick me, please. <laughs> Do you think they picked me second? No, they didn't pick me second either. Do you want to know why they didn't typically pick me first or second or even third or fourth or fifth? Normally I was like the sixth or seventh kid getting. Why don't you think they picked me right away? Because I kept bouncing up and looking like a goofball, right? Yeah. This is a kid that knows how to pick players for his team. Right. No, the real reason, no. You know what? I'm not the fastest. I'm not super slow. But there were some kids that were faster than me. And my other problem, you got to be able to jump pretty high in basketball, right? You want to see how high your pastor can jump? All right, here it goes. This is as high as I possibly can jump. Ready? Ah! Was that high? No. So that was problem number two. And I could dribble the basketball, but I wasn't, I wasn't the best at doing it either. So I remember sometimes when we play basketball, I got kind of disappointed. And every once in a while, there'd be too many boys that I didn't get picked at all. That once they had all their teams picked, I had to go and I had to sit down and I had to watch the game from the sideline. How do you think that made me feel? Made me feel sad. Made me wish that I could have been in the game because I love to play basketball. But here's the cool thing. Did you know that God has a team? Did you know that? God has a team, too. Do you think it's a basketball team? No. God's team isn't a basketball team. It's not a baseball team. It's not a soccer team. It's not a softball team. God's team is filled with Christians. And God's team is filled with boys and girls who try to listen to Jesus, who try to do the right things in life, who try to be nice and kind and loving. And there's a wonderful Bible verse. Boys and girls, I need you to put your listening ears for just a little bit longer because I want to read you. Tammy just read a verse that I really like. So it's from the New Testament. It's in the Bible. It's from Ephesians 1, verse 4. And the Bible tells us that God chose us. Did you know that? God picked you. God picked all of you before the foundation of of the world. Did you know that? Before God even created this earth, the world, before he created the universe, the stars, and the sun, he knew who you were going to be. Did you know 
know that? That before you were even born, we've got a new baby in the church this morning. Did you know that? His name's Augustus. And he's sitting in the back, and he's with his mommy and daddy, Derek and Whitney. And God knew Augustus before Augustus was even born. And God knew you before you were even born. And believe it or not, he said, I want you to be on my team. I want you to be on my team. I want you and you and you and you and you and everybody you see sitting here in church this morning to be on God's team. And that's really, really cool, isn't it, kiddos? Now, what do we typically do when we end our children's message? You remember what we typically do? What do we typically do? Yeah. We normally pray. But since we were talking about being on God's team, I think we should end by putting our hands in the middle. And we'll go one, two, three. And what if we yell as loudly as we can? We say, go God! As loud as we possibly can. Does that sound like a plan? All right, here we go. Team God, let's bring it in. Bring it into the middle. All the hands in the middle here. And I need your help. Okay, we're going to be as loud as as we can, because God's team is the best team to be on. All right, on the count of three, we're going to say, Go God! One, two, three! Go God! All right, thank you so much, kids, for coming up. You can go back to your seats. Praise to you, O Christ. 
Please remain standing as we sing in Christ alone. <laughs> something a little bit lighthearted. And I heard about this brand spanking new pastor. He was just out of the seminary, getting ready to give his very first sermon before his church. Well, this pastor was about as nervous as can be. As he got before his congregation, he tried to, what he tried to do is he tried to memorize the Bible passage that he wanted to preach on, because he wanted to impress his new congregation. But for the life of him, he could not remember that the Bible passage that he was trying to preach on in Revelation. But he remembered one of his professors back in seminary telling him, if you ever get nervous in the middle of your sermon, just back up and repeat yourself. And so as he's preaching, as he's getting ready to go, he's preaching on the book of Revelation, and he's talking about Jesus coming back, his second coming. And 
He knew the first part. He kept saying, behold, I come quickly. But then he forgot what Jesus said after that. And so once again, went back and tried it again. Behold, I come quickly. He just couldn't remember the Bible verse. We tried it a third time. Once again, behold, I come quickly. And he fell forward and fell into the front row of his congregation. And it was just a mess. And everybody was just shocked at how terribly everything was going. And he fell into the lap of a little old lady sitting in the front seat. And he said, oh, I'm sorry, I'm sorry. I was just so nervous. I don't know what happened. She looked at him and she said, Pastor, it's okay. You tried to warn me three times already. <laughs> Grace, I'm glad that's why Lutherans do not sit in the front row. I've always wondered that is why. Grace and peace to you from God the Father and from our Lord and from our Savior Jesus, who is the Christ. Amen. I typically like to preach on whatever our gospel passage of the day is, but our second lesson has just a couple verses that I find incredibly intriguing. And maybe it's because my last church out in West Virginia were half Lutherans, but also half Presbyterians. And if you're a Presbyterian, you know that they're known for, amongst a number of different things, they are known for their belief in this idea of predestination. Predestination is this idea that, that God already knows right this very minute. In fact, God has all, always known from the beginning of time where your soul will be after your death. That right now, right this very minute, God knows that when you take your last breath, whether your soul will be with him in heaven or will be with Satan in hell. And there's a couple verses, and so if you want to pull your bulletin open with me just one more time, a couple verses that Presbyterians kind of use to help kind of make sense of this idea of, of God already knowing. So in particular, I want to look at verse 4 and verse 5 on page 4 of your bulletin. For God's word tells us that just as he chose, so this is God, just as God chose us in Christ before the foundation of the world to be holy and blameless before him in love. So God's word is telling us before the foundation of the world, well, what does that mean? That means that God chose you before he ever started creating. Before day one of creation, two, three, four, five, six, before he started creating the stars above, anything here on earth, he knew who you would be. He chose you to be blameless and holy. And verse 5 continues on. He destined us for adoption as his children through Jesus Christ. There you have it. So that's, that's one of the things that Presbyterians, they'll go to this verse. And it says right here in God's word, it tells us before the world was created, he knew who you would be. He chose you. He claimed you. He destined you to be his child through Jesus Christ. And so I guess kind of the theme of the day is just how much does God know? I suppose today's sermon is a little bit more heady, you know, a little bit less kind of focused on the heart and focused on what's going on in the world. I'd like to kind of dig into one of those things that it's kind of one of those things that a person ponders from time to time. It's one of those things that you think about and you think about and you really stop and wonder just how much does God know about my life and what's going to happen. So just a few questions. Do you think... In your own head, do you think God already knows what you're going to have for supper tonight? Maybe you don't even know what you're going to have for supper tonight. Maybe a better question is, does God remember what you had for supper last night? And how many of you remember that, right? Um, but do you think that God already knows what you're going to have for supper? What do you think? Yes or no? Maybe going a little bit deeper. Does God know what you're going to do tonight? Watch TV? And if you're going to watch TV, what are you going to watch? You know, your favorite sitcom or movie? Does God already know that? 
What about a little bit further out? Does God know what you're going to do next weekend? Does God know your upcoming weekend plan? And once you start thinking about this, once you start thinking about, does God already know these things? You can't help but to take it a little bit further and a little bit further and a little bit further. And a person at the end of it starts to think about, does God already know when I will die? Have you ever thought about that? Does God already know when my last day will be? And if God already knows when my last day will be, once again, getting back to this idea of predestination, does God already know where my soul will be after this? This idea of predestination. Now, I'm going to be frank with you. I'm born and raised a Lutheran from the southeast Nebraska, and this idea of predestination, God already knowing, in a certain sense, God already decided, this does not sit well with me. And I see a lot of you kind of shaking your heads in agreement. This idea of, and part of it is, we struggle with this, don't we? And maybe it's being Americans, and we love the ability to choose how we want to live our lives, and choose how we raise our families, choose where we worship, and so this idea of God already knowing and maybe God already kind of deciding is something hard for us to stomach. But I think there's some things when we stop and think about it, we kind of like the thought of this. If your spouse is sitting next to you, take a look at him and her, and it's a good thought thinking about God already knowing who our spouse would be. So this is a picture of Corey and me on our wedding day. I see Corey grew up in Gretna, I grew up in Beatrice, and the idea of God kind of planning our lives together, I love that thought. Now maybe your spouse is a high school sweetheart and you've always known each other, but Corey and I met each other at a party. I know a pastor, you're not supposed to say you met your spouse at a party. I'm sorry, you already told me you can't get rid of me quite so easily. But we met each other at a party, and I can't help but to look back on that night and, and God kind of already knowing that I was going to be there, Corey was going to be there, we are going to fall in love, have two boys, and our lives would become one. I love thinking about that. I love thinking that, that God knew that, and in some ways maybe God directed that, or more recently. Last spring, as I was getting ready to move back to Nebraska, in the middle of COVID, I had no idea what God's plans were. But now I can step back and I can look at the, the last year plus. I love thinking and knowing that, that my path, my timing, matched up with, with your path and Redeemer's path. And I'm convinced that God you know, leads us together. I, I love these thoughts of God knowing the good things that come about, right? Looking back from, from 2020 vision, and we can look back, and we take joy in seeing God kind of knowing and guiding our paths when they're good. But what about when they don't work out so good? What about those things that don't go right along our life and our path? And if God already knew that was going to happen, you know, why didn't God do something about it? Or why didn't, you know, God just kind of lead me a little bit differently? One of our adult Bible studies on Monday mornings, we're looking at the book of Genesis. And just a couple weeks ago, we read about Adam and Eve. And one of the members in our adult Bible study, I thought, asked the question of the year. As we looked at Eve taking that first bite from that fruit, the first sin as Satan tempted her, the congregational member asked, did God know that Eve was going to do that? In essence, they were asking, did God set Eve up? Oof, you know, that's, that's the million dollar question right there, isn't it? Now, we Christians, most of us at least, believe that God is all-knowing. God knows Everything. The fancy church word for this is God is omniscient. Omniscient. Meaning that God knows everything that's happened in the past. Everything that's already taking place. The, the big things, the things that are in the history books, 
as well as every single little detail in the past. But it doesn't stop there. God knows everything that's going on right this very minute. Everything that's going on. Not only human beings, but animals and in this universe. God knows everything that's going on right now, but it doesn't stop there. We believe that God is all-knowing, and we believe that God knows everything that will happen in the future. God knows everything in the past, present, as well as future. Just to give you, you know, one example from God's word that lifts this idea up. Psalm 139 tells us, and this is David speaking, King David, where David says, Lord, you have searched me and you know me. You know when I sit down and when I rise up, you discern my thoughts from far away. God knows our thoughts. God knows when we sit. God knows when we stand up. You search out my path and my lying down and are acquainted with all my ways. Even before a word is on my tongue. Let me say that again. Even before a word is on my tongue, Lord, you know it completely. God knows everything. One of my favorite verses in all the Bible is Jeremiah 1.5. You know Jeremiah 1.5? Jeremiah 1.5 tells us, Before you were in your mother's womb, God knew you. God knew who you would become before you were even in your mother's womb. Now, John Calvin is up here on the screen. Don Calvin is kind of, Don Calvin is Presbyterian's version of our Martin Luther. We're called Lutherans because of Martin Luther. John Calvin is really, he's the instigator of the Presbyterian church. And he, he lived during the time of Luther. And going back to this idea of God knowing everything, John Calvin has this to say about predestination. He says, God preordained for his own glory and the display of his attributes of mercy and justice. A part of the human race, without any merit of their own, to eternal salvation. And another part, in just punishment of their sin, to eternal damnation. The Presbyterians and some Christians really do believe in this, this idea that God already knows, and in some ways, God has already kind of preordained this. Now, what about free will? What about your choice? Because I know you're sitting there, and if you're like me, this idea of God knowing everything, sometimes this is hard for us to understand. This is hard for us to embrace. But I do believe that God is all-knowing. I think Presbyterians are right about that. God knows everything. God knows everything that's ever happened, as well as everything that will ever happen. But the Bible doesn't stop with that. The Bible does not tell us that just because God knows everything, does that mean that God causes everything to happen? Think about Adam and Eve. What did God do? God put two trees there in the Garden of Eden, the tree of life and the tree of knowledge of good and evil. Was it God? Did God make Eve take that first bite from the, the apple tree? Did God make Adam take that bite from the tree of the tree of the, the tree. It wasn't God. God did not make them. God gave them the choice. In fact, this is one of the great God, the gifts that God gives us. He gives us a gift of free will. He doesn't make us into robots. He doesn't make us do anything in this life. He's given us choices. He's given us the abilities to use our minds and to use our intellects. I believe that God does know of everything that will happen, but God does not cause everything to happen. I think of Jesus Christ. How often does Jesus Christ, after a healing, or after you know, someone is, is forgiven of their sins, he tells them to go and sin no more. They have that ability. They have the, the, the right to make their own choices. Or Jesus Christ tells us to, to pick up what? He tells us to pick up our own cross and to follow him in this life. And so the big question, what is it, Pastor? Is God all-knowing? Is God omniscient? Or do we have free will? I believe we have both. I believe God is all-knowing. And I thank God that he knows all. 
But even more than that, I thank God for the gifts of free will. The gift to wake up just like you did to come to church. The gift to, to, to wake up and to praise God. The gift to, to love those ones in your life that you love. The, the gift to, to live this life, to choose this life, to, to follow Jesus Christ. Or to do that thing the other. These are gifts that God has given to us. Amen? Amen. continues this morning as we confess the Christian faith that we hold in common, using the words of the Apostles' Creed. I believe in God the Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord. He was conceived by the power of the Holy Spirit and born of the Virgin Mary. He suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended into hell. On the third day, he rose again. He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of the Father. He will come again to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. Holy Father, we thank you for filling us with every spiritual grace, that we might be a blessing for others. We pray now that you might consecrate the gifts that we offer for the increase of your love. May they bring blessing to others and praise to your glorious name. Amen. And let us pray. Heavenly Father, we stop and we, we thank you and we praise you on this beautiful morning that you have blessed us with. As we look outside, everything is so green. Uh, we are just so very, very grateful for all the rain that you blessed us with um, this past weekend. Uh, for the corn that continues to grow, for the soybeans and the pastures. Uh, Father, we, we thank you and we pray for those good, continued, timely rains to continue to, to bless our community with, uh, that we might help uh, grow the food that helps feed our world. Lord, in your mercy, hear, hear our prayer. prayer. Holy God, we thank you for the gift of free will. We thank you that we are able uh, to choose and to follow, to pick up our crosses and to follow you in this life. We're very thankful that you led us to worship here this morning, where, where we are surrounded by friends and family and music and your word. We pray that you continue to be with this congregation, uh, that this may be a place that is filled with your word, uh, that we may be a light for this community, uh, that others may be led uh, to follow, pick up their crosses and following you as well. Lord, in your mercy, hear, hear our prayer. Holy God, we pray for all uh, the brave men and women uh, who continue to serve and defend this great nation. Um, in particular this morning, Lord, as we um, continue to watch our military withdraw from Afghanistan and Iraq and other places in the Middle East after uh, many years of war and many years of uh, trying to provide stability in that region of the world. Uh, Father, as we withdraw many of our, our, our people and our forces, we pray for peace. Um, peace in Afghanistan, peace in any other place that um, is just so often filled with violence and hate, um, with corruption and turmoil. Uh, so, Father, we pray that you be in those places, that you send people to, um, to strongly lead them forward um, so that there may be peace in those places. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Holy God, this morning we pray for those um, that are in care homes, retirement homes. Um, we know this past year plus has been really hard for so many of them, um, as often they are not able to see loved ones or to be in community together or enjoy activities together. 
Uh, so this morning, we especially lift up our members who are in care homes this morning. We pray for your presence to be with Leonard Geisler, with Lois Jean Hartman, with Doris Christensen, with Bernice Turnis, with Jean Jensen, and with Sue Blumendahl. And all those we have not named, but we know and we love who are in care homes. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Would you please rise if you're able. Lord, remember us in your kingdom and teach us to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. We will close with just a closer walk with thee. Um, a quick note on how we will sing this this morning. We will start with the refrain, and then we will sing verses 1, 2, and 3 in order before closing again with the refrain. So let us lift our voices to our God. Thanks be to God.